Hello. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Tuesday, the 14th um, show. This is show 17 or 18 or something like that. Thank you for giving up your time again. Hopefully, we'll have some interesting discussions. As always, I'd love to start by finding out who is here. And I was thinking, <clears throat> if you say hello, Maybe you notice in the comments there's someone you're not connected to. Why not um, connect with them and it's that, you know grow your network? So if you're watching, even if you are a regular viewer, like my good friend, Danny, morning, morning. Um, when you see people that pop up, maybe you don't, you're not connected with them. Why not um, connected with them? Good morning, Tom. How are you? Good morning, Joe. We had a great catch up um, last week. I'm expecting some more sort of comments from Joe. <laughs> ah, good day, mate. There's Luke. Morning, Luke. Me and Luke worked together uh, many moons ago in um, in Istanbul, and he, and Luke subsequently come on to the the podcast as well and talked about CCAS. It was really really interesting, and he's just a all round lovely guy. So please do. Keep the comments coming in. Say hello. Let's all say hello to each other. And hopefully got a another really interesting show for you today. I want to start with a um, statistic that I read that um, I think you'll find as shocking as me. It is this. So Gallup. Oh, I'm missing loads. Sorry. Hello, Scott. How you doing? And Nick, good morning. G'day, Peter. <laughs> and Simon. Hello, Simon. How are you? And Laura, up there in sunny Newcastle. Good morning. Hope everyone is having a lovely Tuesday morning. It's my favourite day of the week, um, mainly because of this broadcast. It's nice to feel the nerves. You get this little countdown, and when it's counting down from like a minute, I do get really nervous. But... Um, I love it. So let me just tell you about this um, bit of research that I found. It's And I, I've got the research on my other screen, which I will share with you. Gallup, and it is in the States, um, Gallup showed that 82% of companies believe they've chosen the wrong manager. 82% um, of people are not engaged at work. Well, it's... It's true. Why great managers are so rare is the name of the research. Companies fail to choose the candidate with the right talent for the job 82% of the time. Can you believe that? Um, Simmer, good morning, Barry. Amazing, Barry is. You can carry on banging on about culture all you want. Morning, Mr. T. Slam Duggan, sitting in our marketing office with our newest addition to the sales and marketing team, Brooke. Welcome, Brooke. You're working with a living legend there, Slam Duggan. Um, and I know the ECO outsourcing or ECHO, I know we're not meant to call them that, are coming to their 10th birthday soon. Anyway, let me get on with this. Yeah, so they surveyed a million, um, there was a million participants in the survey it was done in the States, and um, shockingly, companies fail to choose a candidate with the right talent for the job 82% of the time. But they did, oh, I'm Danny, you're going to need to be my IT support again, if that's possible. Whoever this is, can you find out? Morning, everyone. You're, we just need to amend your settings so we, I can say hello. I bet most manage, managers don't blame themselves. <laughs> no, they're in the position, right? But it wasn't all negative. They, the survey and the research allowed them to show the five things that um, good leaders do evidence and that you can work this. Hello, Jules, mate, the DJ. You can evidence this back to, you can work it back to making sure that you do make the right decisions. Luke Thompson, the first rule of Dun Dunning-Kruger Club. 
if you don't know you're in Dunning Group Club. <laughs> oh, Neris is here, ready for some truth bombs. Okay, let me just tell you what the five things were that they said excellent leaders did. They motivate every single member of the team, <clears throat> taking time to realise that one size doesn't fit all. And they worked on individual motivation and found out the, the why for each member of their team. The second one was that they focus on outcomes and they have the ability to overcome adversity and resistance. And I think if we've all been in leadership positions, that first time that people don't fully buy into what you're offering or you're suggesting can be a bit of a challenge. So you have the ability to overcome adversity and resistance. They create a culture of accountability and one where it's okay to be vulnerable. And I liked how they match these two things together so that you work on accountability and you make people, you hold people accountable, you hold yourself accountable, but you are also in, develop a culture, Danny, here you go, a culture of one where it's okay to be vulnerable. And that starts with the uh, the leader. Next, I'll go see what I did there. Okay, and four, they build relationships that create trust, open dialogue and transparency. And there's a really nice part in here about um, communication and you can't communicate enough. You just got to keep communicating even when things or especially when things go, go wrong. And they make decisions based on productivity and not politics. Peace signal illuminates the sky. <laughs> um, these are the kind of studies and areas we're discussing and sharing in the community. So um, if you would like to be part of it, please just let me know. Now, let me share my um, screen just so you can see the... Um, here we go. This one. So this is the study why great managers are so rare. Uh, I will share the link in the comments so you can see it because it links to a further study by Harvard Business Review as well. Um, and it is excellent. I can't recommend it enough. It's a fascinating read. Um, okay. So now then, are you ready to have a, an informed debate? Here's my opinion. You asked for more opinion-based stuff, and I know this might be a bit of a contentious one, but let's see what you think. Are offshore outsourcers hurting our UK-based providers, or is the competition good for us? And um, I think we're coming across, and you hear on from just talking to people in the industry, you see on LinkedIn, there are some brilliant centers around the world and there are absolutely brilliant centers in the, in the UK. And given the people that are watching today, what do, you, what do you think of this? Are offshore outsourcers hurting our UK-based providers or is the competition good? And I think we need to consider our industry, our customers, our employees and, and just the future. Now then, let's just go back a sec. Danny's on a roll. Often advisors are made managers, but not then invested in for new skills and mindset required for that role. It's a disservice to the individual and to the organization. Very true. I think you'll find this um, research fascinating, Danny. Um, like I say, I will share it in the LinkedIn comments here um, when the show is finished. But just starting with this question, what is what are your opinions? When we see um, brands going to South Africa and East Europe and they're delivering a great service, but they're delivering it at a much lower cost, what is that doing for our industry? Sorry, again, Barry. Well, I don't want to miss anything from Barry. Agree, Danny Warren. When we promote, we need to ensure we support and train more once they're enrolled to help make them great. Get them in the community is all I'd say. <laughs> um, I think there's a time and a place for offshoring. There are skill sets that some of these territories have 
that we just don't. Fact. Great point, Phil. Great point. What kind of um, skill sets are you thinking? Is all competition not good competition? Really true. Do we, we get better, don't we? We get better through competition. Get them in the community. <laughs> yes, exactly. Come on, everybody. The water's lovely in here. Um, offshore can and do add value, but often they're looked at as a cost-saving exercise. So transactional or non-emotive interactions are sent abroad. It feeds into the inaccurate narrative that overseas is just for cheap, basic, rote activities. Really, really true. Really true. Great tip for a chat about leadership. My old business unit director in my old job in Czech had been interviewed in his new role. Basic principles that work for all. So true, Jules. Agree with Barry. Competition is great. Pay that. Bad service is bad service. Doesn't matter where the contact centre is situated. Generally, this is driven by poor culture, reinforcing the wrong focus areas, behaviours, managing the wrong metrics. Really good point, Pete. Barry Cooper. Not if it's just price. Thanks, Bev. And I guess this is sometimes the nub of the decision making, isn't it? Is it is it price? And we've seen, haven't we, ebbs and flows where in our industry um, there was a, a rush offshore and then a rush back. And now we seem to have much like our home working and um, contact center based, a bit of a hybrid. So not if it's competition isn't good, not if it's just price, Bev is saying. Love Bev. Um, competition is good and can, can enhance the offer when combined with the UK offer. Interesting, Jules, isn't it? When you combine the two, um, onshore and offshore can exist together. In fact, I wonder if all seats were retained in the UK, there would be enough people to fill them. This would drive up competition for talent. <clears throat> yes, well, we know we, we do have a bit of an attraction problem in our industry, don't we? Uh, as for my previous post, I meant to include a link. I'll add it in a second. Oh, brilliant. Thanks, Jules. Uh, competition, no. Rivalry, yes. Iron sharpens iron. So true. I think if you think about work and um, sport and life in general, some element of competition, it drives us all forward, doesn't it? Found in the past that some business send offshore and then forget that the contact center still needs to be brought into the business and then the service changes. Really true, Barry. So that kind of, um, even in our digital age where we are all connected, are you saying that that distance sometimes means that there's not joined up thinking when you have gone offshore? Craig, Craig's here. Brilliant. Craig is awesome. If you haven't connected with Craig, please do. Uh, I think a blend is best of both UK and offshore. Example being in South Africa next week. Political unrest means the South Africa Centre shut in for the day. Monday and Tuesday will be your bank holiday, I'm assuming. Bank home working also isn't working offshore. Interesting. My, my knowledge of offshore needs to be um, improved, definitely. Offshore time zones give businesses, good point, Tom, the option to offer extended hours of telephone chat without antisocial working hours. I was talking to someone at 8 p.m. UK time, which would have been 4 p.m. in Canada. If lowest possible price is a primary reason, then you'll get what you pay for from any location. We have a talent shortage in UK contact centres, but are slow to invest in professionalising and using specialist support services. Really true, Peter. Um, you need a rival to keep you sharp. Rivals highlight your weaknesses. Really good point. Um, I'll, I'll go off on a tangent if I'm not careful. <laughs> There's a really good exercise that you can do with that with your team. It's brilliant. Um, I've missed a hit. Uh, competition is something to be beaten, but it's a short term and temporary. A worthy rival is far more powerful. Stop it. I've got a girlfriend. Yeah, I know it. She's very formidable as well. So I'm going to back off now, Craig. Um, Contact centres, whether onshore or offshore, are burdened by bad processes and poor objectives. 
On the UK, I think this may be easier to handle hide. When offshoring, a lot of management is needed by the brand to maintain good service for the customer. Good point, Nick. I think it really does put, you really have to have your client or your offshore managing team on the on the money, don't you? People in the UK market from Luke have both offshore and automation as competition. Companies need to evaluate the overall impact to customer value. There will always be a market for excellence Really good point, because I think often we, um, if it is a race to the bottom and price, rather than thinking, how can we learn from people that are excellent? Um, ah, great. Thanks, Jules. More on the team leader subject. This was a podcast. Josh is super knowledgeable. I loved working with him. Learned so much from him. Hope you enjoy the listen. Brilliant. Thank you for that. Craig Watts and a lovely girlfriend. She is too. I agree. <clears throat> Feels like Hollyoaks. Look at Danny down with the kids. I haven't watched Hollyoaks in about 30 years. Is it still on? <laughs> Holly, Hollyoaks Dark, I seem to remember. Um, so what it is, when you look at um, this picture then and all of your amazing comments, it does make you think about the, the decision makers and who are making the decisions to either go offshore or utilize a UK-based um, BPO or outsourcer. That, I think, is critical, isn't it? Neris, if you ask any business to take care of your frontline brand engagement, then the brand has to invest in engaging with those businesses. My experience is that simple geograph geography makes this investment harder. Not impossible, but harder. Excellent point, Neris. Danny Ram, love the language you use and the way you all make me think more about the language I use and how it can be so impactful. Everything starts with language, doesn't it? Danny's an expert at that. Good point, Barry. Um, having worked in South Africa with partners, I think there is a place. I believe there is room for both. One point I would say is that in my experience, the contact service industry is really seen as a career choice there. And I think in the UK, we still have some way to go in order to show how amazing our industry can be for people's careers in this sector. Simon, I couldn't agree more. My experience of working in Turkey and going to some of the more rural areas of Turkey, um, and well, to be honest, even in Istanbul, working in a contact centre was seen as something to chase and something that was brilliant. Um, I went to a university in a very um, sparse part of Turkey called Afyon, and we were in the university just talking to people who were about to graduate and all of them wanted to work in the contact centre that we were considering using as, a, as an outsourcer. Um, and their passion for getting that job was something that will stick with me forever. And I think you're, you're dead right. Um, some mutual love going on here. I love it. Barry Cooper, this is from Danny. Language always matters. It's so nuanced yet powerful. If it encourages people just to have a momentary aha moment, that's enough for me. Thanks. Julie's here. Simon Ryan, totally agree, Simon. We have a lot of work to do to promote the sector as a career of choice. If you think about the wonderful, wonderful people you all are and the people on this, on the um, show today, well, surely there is a way that we can kind of get this message across to people. You know, like I said, that university in um, uh, Turkey just was a privilege to go and spend time with people that are about to graduate and were thinking about career choices and asking why we should work in a contact centre. We need to do more of that. I saw with interest um, Marianne Withers has a connection, doesn't she, to um, Portsmouth Uni. And I just wonder if it's things like that that we need to start getting out there a bit more. Simmer, definitely agree there's room for both. I do believe whatever the location, there needs to be cultural synergy. Really good point, Simmer, in order to keep creating excellent customer experience. <laughs> Danny and Barry sitting in a tree, K-I-S-S-I-N-G. Interested to know from the community why it isn't a career choice in the UK. 100% of our management team have worked their way up from advisor level and have really great careers now. Phil, this, this, is, the, this is the point, isn't it? That, <clears throat> excuse me, how do, we, 
how do we break this? How do we get to this point where people won't just go, are you kidding? When you say, why don't you come and work in a contact center? Um, <laughs> Beverly Hughes. Interestingly enough, um, I was going to mention it in next week's show, but I'll mention it now. Uh, even though Get Out of Rap and me being self-employed and owning a company, which is just me and Hugo, uh, in uh, the, the last week of March, I am, I've got three people coming to do work experience. One is my stepdaughter, Melody, and it's her two friends. So I might need your help in kind of um, putting them to work. Yesterday, but, uh, I, but I shared in the team leader community that the uh, three girls were coming to work with me and I had some plans for them and Bev said it hashtag slave labor so but I will be picking their brains about our industry and seeing where they start at the start of the week in terms of thinking about contact centers as a career and where they finish at the end of the week so I could make it worse but they're going to be my little test um the view of contact centres abroad is very different to the UK. They're seen as careers and often need a degree just to get in the door. Yet we in the West often treat them with the same opinion that many here have about contact centres, that they're unskilled stopgap jobs only. Danny, very true. Um, Phil Duggan, from my time in Czech BPO, it is an accidental career. You go in thinking that it'll do for now. This was me. Then it grabs you as you progress. I think we, we can all um relate to that can't we how do we how do we fast forward that bit that's some strong strong tree yes it is. well Bar barry's losing the lbs by the day um how oh, are lee's here lee oh can i say where you've been working lee or is it have i got to sign the official secrets act lee's a, probably what he's in my top five best humans on the planet how do i get work experience with you <laughs> We're, it, it will be difficult to fit everyone in this little broom cupboard, but Lee, you can come and do work experience whenever you want, mate. Um, how do we get the word out? And what more can we do to get business and people to see that working in a contact center is a career? Um, you know, I think I, I, I can lose myself often. Barry, it's a really good point. I can lose myself often in, in TikTok and... Um, if you just search call center, both spellings of center in TikTok, none of it's very positive. But I think that's because it focuses on some of the challenges. You know, a lot of us, we've all been agents, right? And let's be honest, there's been some, you, you are challenged. Um, but for every Steve Bartlett that says being on the phones gave him the skills to be a CEO, there's a hundred other people on TikTok saying um, it's, it's not a good job. Okay. In answer to Phil's question, compare customer service salaries with local alternatives. In Romania, for example, they're comparable with teachers and civil servants. Here, pay might just be above minimum wage. Offshore, comparable with degree level jobs. Really true. 100% um, chores. I think Martin has mentioned before the number of people that entered as a contact centre and then stayed for years. If you think, even just the podcast, right, there's... I, I, I'm up to 154 or something like that. The vast majority of the guests that have been on fell into our roles by accident, fell into our industry by accident, got bitten by the bug, love it and love it with a passion. Um, how do we how do we best get that message across? Um, personally, I think offshore outsourcing has changed over the last few years. This is Scott, more so since the pandemic. Interesting to make that point, mate. Originally seen as a cheaper option, I feel that offshore outsourcing has shifted more towards getting a niche, highly skilled group of employees from technical ability to multilingual support. I see a blend of on and offshore is appropriate for most businesses. Really good point, mate. Julie, Barry Cooper, it's not just about reaching our future talent, but those who influence their career-making decisions. Yes, Julie, what a great point. Um, Offshore in the more basic of work, the high volume seems to be initial outsource step of choice when it leaves a more complex of tasks or work to be done, meaning onboarding is tougher in terms of task system and overall context onshore. It's true, Craig, isn't it? 
There's also the brand power. I've seen BPOs in India, Egypt, Philippines, etc. They're super proud to work on behalf of the big company. They don't say they work for X outsource, or they actively brag about working for the contractor company. True, Danny, I, I've seen that in the UK as well. We, we had teams that would say they worked for the bank rather than the name of our um, company. Sima, I know this is a passion of yours. It's an absolute passion of mine. We've implemented story time into our training process. Once candidates are recruited and are through to group sessions, we get people from our teams to pop in and deliver stories of their journey in the industry, where they started versus where they are now. It's proving to be really powerful. Excellent. Can you ask Melody and her friends to listen to my rap? I've sent you the recording and see if that helps change their view on working in contact centers. Maybe we should share the rap on next week's show, Neris. What do you reckon? Um, my view is that there are more consumers in the UK that have had bad experience with a contact centre and this influences people's views on contact centres from a consumer perspective and as a career choice, really true, Phil. And there you go, Danny, it needs to be published here. Um, Danny, where I'm there is called Phil, this has legs. <laughs> Craig, what? <laughs> Turns cap backwards. I love a baseball cap, I haven't worn it for a while, so you get to see my wham head. A lot of it is, it's not a good job, Chat comes back to your first point on the 85%. There needs to be human leadership and engaging culture, clarity of purpose and intentional development strategies without all, it's just a job. Very true. Same thing with sales advisors. It's like a dirty little secret. The reputation of salespeople have outside our industry is shocking. So true, Simmer. Barry agrees with you, Julie. So true. We all need to influence those we can and keep supporting them people in their career choices and I wonder if that's you know going for governorships of schools and things like that wherever you can make an influence in your local community even in even in a small way um just with the girls football team often the parents ask me what do I do as a job um and I'll say I work in the contact center industry their next question is what is that and then I say call centres. So I think, again, to your point earlier on, Danny, language, the rest of the world in our, or the UK hasn't caught up with our change, contact call centre to contact centre. So perhaps we start there. Um, we should live stream your career block into, into schools. We should. Uh, I'd love to be like a kid's, kid's book car, uh, character actually lulled to the cap comment come on we've all got them right so th this has been brilliant everybody i want to just take um take you now do you remember we were doing the contact babel read along there were still a couple of sections left in the qa section still keep all of these comments coming on offshore um uk or offshore and please do keep them com coming about how we can better portray our industry uh, out there to people that are considering where they want to work. But let's now dive back into Contact Babel. This is a nice way of you all um, getting the highlights from the 465 pages of really good stuff, actually. So we are on QA. Effectiveness of quality assurance by channel. I'm not going to preempt this by telling you what I think. But you can see here by the channels and you've got the inbound, outbound, emails, web, social media, back office. And then the green is very effective, fairly effective, ineffective. And you can see the highest percentage that says very effective is inbound calls. That's only at 36%. I, I guess you could say very effective and fairly effective is kind of positive. Well, fairly effective is kind of positive but I look at this and I have a certain opinion but I'd love to know what you think when you when you look at this so this is what the respondents answered when they were asked about the effectiveness of their QA by channel because there's one word that keeps flying out to me on this one but I'd love to know what what you think first and I can also have a quick drink What's the measure of effectiveness? Does that mean they're a compliant? I.e. it's a yes, no measure. Well, there's a Danny, really good question. There's another 
there's another cup there's another couple of slides coming up um that i think might might answer that because again you're right if people just consider qa to be whether you're adhering to compliant or regulatory you know areas then it's quite limited isn't it the word that comes up to me here and um is opportunity what what a great opportunity there is here um Pete's focus on the same thing effective yeah really true it doesn't actually say in there um and that's probably a a key point isn't it what does effective mean yeah define effective okay I will go back and double check but I didn't see anything that did define effective but um the other thing that I thought as well is there's a lot of people that are not QAing. Oh no, it's not that they're not using. They use a channel, but they do not evaluate it. 18% on emails. It's bizarre. Okay, so the next part in the read along was challenges to managing performance and quality. And I think this is really important. You get a lovely little snapshot whether you're in the whether you're in our market to sell technology or services or you're thinking of purchasing things here we go challenges to managing performance and quality technology doesn't support quality and performance management 38 percent say that is a major problem which is fascinating isn't it when you think about how the the leaps forward we've had with um technology that does support quality and performance management but again what a great opportunity there, 38%. Um, this is one that keeps coming up and I'm sure we can all relate to. Not enough time to analyze data. And in my previous role, we'd see this all the time. We'd see companies that had purchased a lot of technology and were suddenly inundated with data and they just didn't have the time to analyze it. Again, not enough time. Not enough time or resources to coach and train. My God. Um, staff do not have the skills to analyze data. So even if you do get the technology that supports quality and performance management, you, there's a high percentage that say they don't have time to analyze the data. They don't have time or resources to coach and train using that data. And their staff do not have the skills to analyze data. It's, it's, it's really enlightening kind of stats here, isn't it? Oh, sorry, I've missed a few here. Um, Craig, if it's not binary, it should be coaching in an arm round session. Very true, Craig. Danny, my issue with QA, pulls out soapbox, oh, here we go, is that it is often nothing to do with the actual quality. It's about regulatory or yes, no compliance. Did you say the name three times? Did you complete DPA? Did you leave accurate notes? Yes, I'm, I'm sure... There's a certain Pete here that could talk about this for a long time. Um, some of the best channels for low effort issue resolution are chat, social media, use them, QA them. Yes, my God, come on. I agree with you, Bev. This is, is eye-opening stuff, isn't it? I think we can all say, can't we, that Contact Babel probably has the longest standing, largest number of people that are surveyed in our industry about matters about these kind of key matters and like i've said before i'm just reading this i have no contact with contact babel um i don't even know if they know i'm doing this <laughs> hope they're okay with it um it is eye-opening isn't it the, these kind of um these kind of stats here not enough time not enough time don't have the skills come on surely this has got to be a big a big priority um, did the customer leave the interaction happier than when they joined it? And again, I know Pete and everyone at BPA will be, these are the sorts of things that they spend their, their lives doing, right? This type of question, Danny, is, is really important and really progressing your QA. All of this, to me, talks about opportunity. There's a, this huge opportunity there. The technology does exist. You've had, you, if you find the time to make sure that you are key and looking at your data, you can make it work for you and you can give people, you should always give people the time and resources to coach and train. Maybe we'll have another session on 
what is insight. Let me just crack on now. The very next visual was, are you improving QA and coaching as a key part of helping your agents? So 36% strongly agree. 37% agree. <laughs> I do not know what the neutral disagree and strongly disagree people were thinking. Did they misread the question? I mean, someone help, someone help me out here. Am I Have I missed the mark here on being kind of bamboozled by how you could be neutral or disagree or strongly disagree here? Is it is it as a result of the fact that they're overwhelmed? I, I don't know. Please, answers on a postcard. Scott, would be interesting to know whether the bulk of the major problem with technology doesn't support quality and performance management are because the business choose the cheapest tool rather than the right tool because they cannot attribute an ROI to quality improvement. Isn't it interesting, Scott, that... If, a lot of the quest a lot of the comments and questions here are about decision makers and um that thing there they cannot attribute roi to quality improvement fascinating really good point danny wareham amazing how often org seems to focus on this the best way to deliver low maturity low focus high cost qa functions is to focus on compliance and the low value yes no tick box activity really true Nick, they are not improving what they do. It's mental. Um, 70% plus 70% agree. Whilst just this week, we've seen redundancies made to QA analysts and coaches. Don't talk about it, be it. Couldn't agree more, Danny. Simmer, I'd be interested to know the split across in house contact centers versus outsourced contact centers this data is based on, and a further breakdown of customer services forward slash support versus sales activity there's some extra stuff in there i've kind of cherry picked a little bit um so i think it might be in there simmer i think neutrally just meh still poor show if you're not dedicated to improving your agents and qa really true such a false economy not having the time to coach led by budgets being squeezed when will companies understand that ensuring the team are coached and effectively will not just lower your total contacts overall but ensure your customer value which increases bottom line contribution, nailing the moments that matter. Really true, Simon. Really true, mate. My question about this slide, improve, improving QA, is if two-thirds of respondents are improving QA and coaching, is this working for agents and the customer experience? Good question, Nick. <clears throat> Joe's coming in big here. Data can 100% power differentiation for businesses. It's something we feel very strongly about at Savio. In fact, we're in the middle of an advisor empowerment campaign just now, which is aimed at encouraging organizations to give their advisors everything they need to deliver excellent customer experience with understanding data at the heart. Thanks, Joe. And there's the link there if anybody wants it. Why would you not coach and look to improve? <laughs> I know, Barry, it's bizarre, isn't it? Right, let's crack on. Um, use of interaction analytics by contact center size so again the large contact centers uh report the highest percentage of use now no plans to replace or use now looking to replace upgrade and then you have the smaller ones that are have the highest percentage of no plans to implement oh yeah we've the the chapter's changed we've gone now from qa to interaction analytics there's a whole chapter on on that so i guess this is more about who's using it and who plans to implement it over the next 12 months or after 12 months um what does it mean or who's using interaction um interaction analytics type so by far the highest percentage 49 percent of respondents use this functionality and the highest one, historical post-call speech analytics. So I don't know about you. I can remember being at conferences and, ever, you know, this was maybe five, six years ago. 
and people were loving speech analytics. There's a lot of the people on stage were talking about it. And one of them, one of the pers- people on stage said, who actually has speech analytics? And it was quite a low number. It would seem from this now, and this bears, um, I, I feel this myself, I see this myself, but it seems that now 49% of respondents are using post-call speech analytics. Uh, and you can see there the the stats around going all the way down to real-time speech analytics, 24%. Okay, Barry Cooper, some cultures create competition and fear. In those environments, people don't put their heads above the parapet, let alone point out their perceived issues. Very, very true. Does, is, does this ring true for all of you guys? Are you finding now that nearly half of everyone out there is using post-call speech analytics. I wonder if they've got the time to analyze the data or coach to their people. <laughs> um, but you think here there's some really interesting developments happening, certainly in multi-channel, certainly in real-time speech analytics. And I have to admit a bit of ignorance as to what's the differentiator here? What's the difference between post-call speech analytics and desktop analytics can someone more intelligent than me um help me on this okay we're nearly there guys i, I appreciate i'm running over a little bit but it's been such good converse, uh, conversations okay does any does anyone on this session actually use speech analytics great question simon answers please um danny wareham this is from Barry. Sadly, so true. I've been in one or two of these environments. Didn't last long, mind. As I had to raise my head above the parapet. Of course you did, mate. That's who you are. Um, Barry Cooper, I feel that. Maybe 49% have speech analytics. I don't believe 49% are using it. Bev coming in with some lovely, lovely points here. Apologies, need to go. Good broadcast, my own thanks. You're a great host. Superb contributions from all. Thank you very much, Nick. Appreciate that. Have a great day, mate. Okay, last one. Usefulness of... Oh, hold on. Thanks, Neris. Desktop is screen recording, how they're interfacing with the tools, speech as well, speech. Oh, okay. So it tracks their cursors. Yeah, I have seen that. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> I met a client yesterday using our analytics to blame Martin Lewis on her poor call answering performance. <laughs> There you go. Okay. Um, Usefulness of post-call analytics. This is fascinating. And to your earlier um, point, okay, this is answering Simon's, I think, isn't it? From my experience, many individuals don't analyze the speech that's been literally said to them live. So true, Danny, on the language again, isn't it? Barry, don't have speech analytics at the moment, but I'm looking at options and how we can use it to improve for our people and our customers. Well, hopefully, Barry, these, time of, these types of stats that people are sharing will, will help you kind of get that plan together. But look, look at this. Usefulness of post-call analytics. By far, very useful, 48%. Flagging instances of non-compliance with regulations or script is by far the, the, the point that gets the best Biggest response for very useful. Automating speeding up the quality monitoring process, 38%. Identifying training requirements at an agent level, 34%. Identifying improvements to business processes, 34%. Gaining insight into customers, 23%. Influencing future scheduling of staff or routing of calls, 17%. Providing information about competitors, I, I have to say that if this is the use, if this is what people are finding useful, wouldn't it be great if this was kind of the other way around? Gaining insight into customers, identifying improvements to business processes, identifying training requirements at an agent level. For me, those three are the, are the most important. Um, speeding up your quality monitoring process. Mm. 33 somewhat useful, 38% very useful. Flagging instances of non-compliance. It's just 
that's a basic, isn't it? Um, it seems like there's a again a great, great opportunity here with these three, but I'd love to know. Um, I'd love to know what you guys think. Although I am conscious of time, and you guys have given up a lot of your time already. I have nothing else to do, so I could stay on here forever. <laughs> um, what do you make of this one? The usefulness of post call analytics. Do you have the same view as me that um, there's so much more that you can do, uh, and if you're just using it to kind of speed up your process? and flag non-compliance yeah that's of course that's important if you're in a regulated environment but that's just the the tip of the iceberg surely with the functionality that exists you could really work and give real kind of focused um training focused improvements on a process focused improvements on um customers Phil, real-time speech analytics can provide more value to agents on the call, give them real-time prompts, info to pass on to customers. No good after the call, definitely uses to support <coughs> advisors. Great point, Phil. How often have you seen non-operational people call listen or use call recordings to learn about consumers' competitors? It's very much used as a cold face compliance tool. Really true. Julie, Danny Wareham will listen to what's being said. Yeah, exactly. Too often you've got, again, some of the decision makers need to come and listen to, to what's going on and really make use of these um, make use of these tools. Well, everybody, it's been a, a tour de force today. You've um, you've shown up and I, I feel I feel much <laughs> I was going to say clever, but that's uh, I'm a bit of an oxymoron. Um, but thank you so much for all your comments. Thanks for giving up your time uh, and um, contributing. It's been it's been brilliant. I definitely think we need a whole session on how we can improve the perception of our industry and share some of these um, stories. So I will give that some thought. And um, thank you again for watching. Uh, I hope you have a lovely day. And I will um, see you all next Tuesday. Bye-bye, everyone.